Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our evening service. <coughs> uh, warm welcome if you're watching on screen, on live stream this evening. Um, are they, will we have the Psalms on, on? No. So you require to have a Psalm book. Uh, if there's anyone who doesn't have a Psalm book, uh, the elders or deacons will uh, make one available to you. Uh, <clears throat> let us worship God this evening then by singing to his praise in Psalm 109 in the Scottish Psalter on page 387. Psalm 109 on page 387 in the Blue Book. And we shall sing from verses 1 to 7 down to the bottom of the page. O thou the God of all my praise, do thou not hold thy peace. For mouths of wicked men to speak against me do not cease. The mouths of vile deceitful men against me opened be, and with a false and lying tongue they have accused me. And so on to the bottom of the page. Uh, and when by thee he shall be judged, let him condemned be, and let his prayer be turned to sin when he shall call on thee. We sing these verses unto God's praise, Psalm 109 at the beginning. O thou the God of all my praise. O thou the God of all my praise, do thou not hold thy peace for months of wicked men to speak again? together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, uh, we give you thanks that uh, once again we are able to gather together in your house to worship you. And we thank you that you have given us that privilege once again this day, and that you have brought us together uh, to worship. For you are a God who is worthy of all worship. You are the sovereign God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. 
And we thank you, O Lord, that that is the case, that we are unable to reach to that level of holiness, even although you tell us to be holy even as you are holy. Nevertheless, our sinful nature prevents us from being uh, able to do that. But we thank you that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And that is <clears throat> the promise that your people hold on to day by day, sins past, sins present, and sins future. For we sin daily in thought, word, and deed. But yet we look forward to the day when we shall stand in your presence, fully sanctified, and when the evil one will no longer be able to attack us or have dominion over us. For that, uh, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and man became guilty of original sin, that is the characteristic that is present in our lives, no matter how hard we try to eliminate it. But we thank you that your people are able to thrive, that they strive daily uh, <clears throat> in holiness to worship you and to come to you and to plead at the throne of grace for mercy. For we have need of mercy as a people, as a congregation, as individuals, but especially as a nation. We pray, O Lord, that you would be merciful to us once again that the country that once was known the land as the land of the book and sent out missionaries all over the world, that once again it would become a country that professes faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have need of days of awakening. We have need of a revival, of your spirit being poured out again once, once again among us. Uh, throughout our congregation, throughout our island, throughout our land. And we thank you that we hear great things from other parts of the world where the Spirit is working, where you are bringing people to a saving knowledge of you. And especially in areas where your church and your people are persecuted as they have never been before. And perhaps uh, it is an indication that uh, we are in our comfort zone, that our lives have become too comfortable, especially spiritually, and yet <clears throat> we see the seeds of uh, the seeds of persecution being sown even here in our own land. We thank you that we have freedom still to gather together to worship, that we have your word in our own languages. And we thank you for the work of so many and so many Bible societies around the world who are translating your word into other languages. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless their efforts, uh, that they would be able to raise the necessary finance to do that. And we thank you that your word is not uh, bound uh, nowadays to the printed page, but available in all sorts of media outlets. We thank you for those who uh, are watching this evening on the live stream, unable to be with us in person that you would uphold and strengthen and bless them, and uh, that their homes would be a little sanctuary to them, wheresoever they are. We remember uh, the minister of the congregation this evening, that you would bless him where he is with his family, uphold and strengthen him in his ministry here. And we pray also for the elders and the deacons and all those involved in WFM and Sabbath schools and the various other activities of the congregation that you would bless and strengthen and guide in all these things. And we remember this evening again the free church camps. We pray that you would bless them, O Lord, the children there and those who are ministering to them. Uh, grant them safety in their journey and journeying mercies and uphold and bless the activities during the week. And grant favorable weather if that be your, uh, your will. We remember also the church in St Andrews and Paul Clark and uh, the various others that are with him. We pray for the Snedden family, uh, <clears throat> that you would restore Hamish to health, if that be your will. And we remember also Jody and Matty Guy, who will be shortly taking up uh, <clears throat> the ministry in Dingwall Free Church. We thank you for them. We pray also for the country of Turkey, as we hear more and more uh, stories of your church being persecuted there in a way that it was not persecuted before. 
There are so many parts of the world where your people are persecuted. And we pray particularly for those in North Korea and in Afghanistan at this time. Oh, that you would do a work in these countries. And throughout parts of Africa still covered by war in certain areas, that you would bring peace. But uh, <coughs> your word tells us that there will be war and tribulation and rumours of war even until the end times. For well, that is the nature of man and the nature of sin that does beset us round about. We pray also for uh, so many other people who are suffering displacement at this time, uh, being forced to uh, flee from their, their relative places of safety to other countries, especially in parts of Africa. And uh, we thank you, O Lord, that you have a witness there. Uh, we pray for uh, Latin America, that you would uphold your church there at this time and strengthen it. And for Australia and New Zealand and uh, <coughs> the various islands of the Pacific. But above all, we pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit would be poured out here in our own country once again. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down as you have done before that we would see streams in the desert and hear the voice of the turtle dove in our land once again. We have need of cleansing, we have need of renewal, we have need of revival. And we pray, O oh Lord, for all those who have no word of coming to your house and no interest whatsoever in it throughout our villages and throughout our island. <clears throat> we pray, O oh Lord, that once again we would see the churches being filled uh, and people coming to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, realizing the situation uh, that they are in with regards to eternity. Uh, and you remind us every single day that here we have no continuing city, but we look for one to come. Oh, bless once again uh, <coughs> to us uh, the voice of death as we hear it throughout our villages and uh, indeed throughout our country that uh, we would come to realize that there are things that are more important than the life we have here on earth as we look to eternity uh, and uh, what is involved in it. Be merciful to us as a nation. Remember those who rule over us. Uh, remember our king and queen and the royal family. And we pray that they would come to a saving knowledge of you. Uh, remember uh, those who rule over us in Parliament in uh, London and in Edinburgh. And we pray, O oh Lord, uh, that you would bring uh, a spirit of renewal there, that you would cleanse these parliaments from the uh, unseen and perhaps unknown corruption that goes on within these institutions. Uh, and yet much of it is coming to light at this time in a way that no one suspected. And so the situation with so many of our institutions where power and the love of power is uh, more important than anything else, grant that they would rule for the good of the nation and not for their own good. And we pray, O oh Lord, uh, that uh, that would be the case even here in our own island. We thank you for our call and all the work that it does. But we pray, O oh Lord, that it would uphold the principles of your word and the various <coughs> activities that they do. And we thank you that that has been the case in general up till now. We pray for the children on holiday at this time, that you would bless them and uh, strengthen parents uh, to be able to be with them and look after them and to teach them the first principles of the word of God. As these things are no longer taught in schools like they used to be, be with us now as we come to meditate on a portion of your word. Grant your blessing, grant your presence, for you have promised for two or three are gathered together in your name that you are there. And we believe that you are here. Oh, that you would make yourself known to us in power this evening, that we would be able to say that it was good for us to have been here. Bless us and guide us and be with us as we come to meditate on a portion of your word and pardon sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Let us sing again in Psalm 38. 
Psalm 38 on page 257. And we'll sing the verses marked 14 down to 22. Psalm 38 on page 257. As one that hears not, in whose mouth are no reproofs at all. For Lord, I hope in thee, my God, thou'lt hear me when I call. For I said, hear me, lest they should rejoice o'er me with pride, and o'er me magnify themselves, when as my foot doth slide. And we'll sing down to verse 22, the end of the psalm, 21 and 22. Forsake me not, O Lord my God, far from me never be. O Lord, thou my salvation art, haste to give help to me. Let's sing these verses in Psalm 38, page 257, as one that hears not, in whose mouth are no reproofs at all. As one that hears not, in whose mouth are no reproofs at all. For Lord, I hope in thee, my God, let hear me when I call. For I said, hear me, lest they should rejoice o'er me with pride. And o'er me magnify themselves, when as my foot does fly, for I am near to hold my grief, is still before my eye. For I'll declare my sin and grief, for my iniquity. But yet my name is lively uh, and strong uh, they beside. And they that hate me wrongfully me are greatly multiplied. And they for good that render To follow what is good. Forsake me not, Lord, <coughs> my God, far from me never be. O Lord, thou my salvation art, is to give help. Let us uh, read God's word then as we find it in the New Testament in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians and in chapter 2. <coughs> Paul's second letter to the Corinthians and chapter 2. It's on uh, page 1146 in this version of the scripture. I don't know if that corresponds to your, yours or not. Second Corinthians 2, and we shall read the whole chapter. For I made up my mind, that is Paul, not to make another painful <coughs> visit to you. But if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure for all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. 
For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Amen, and may the Lord bless that reading of his holy and infallible word to us, and to his name be the praise. Let's sing again in Psalm 51. Page 281, Psalm 51, on page 281, and we'll sing the verses marked 7 to 14. Verse 7 down to the bottom of the page. Do thou with his up sprinkle me, I shall be cleansed so. Yea, wash thou me, and then I shall be whiter than the snow. Of gladness and of joyfulness make me to hear the voice, that so these very bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. And so on down to verse 14. O God of my salvation, God, me from blood guiltiness set free. Then shall my tongue aloud sing of thy righteousness. These great verses of David's confession of his sin. Psalm 51 then at verse 7. Do thou with hyssop sprinkle me. <coughs> Do thou with hyssop sprinkle me, I shall be
Let's turn back then to the uh, chapter that we read, the second letter, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 2. And we can read again at verse 10. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant <coughs> of his designs, or his devices, as it is in the A.B. Particularly the, verse, the words in verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Uh, if you were here last Sabbath evening, <coughs> uh, you would have seen as we worked through a passage in 1 Corinthians, uh, why Paul had written uh, the letter to the church at Corinth about particular things that were going wrong, and especially a particular <laughs> sin that was taking place in the church. And now he's received a reply, and so he is seeing that this has been dealt with, or dealt with up to a point. And therefore, he is expressing uh, his forgiveness to that particular person. You see that in verse 6, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. And those of you who are familiar with uh, the letters to the Corinthians will know that that was a particular sexual sin that was involved in the congregation there. And that many of these things, of course, uh, once you know a little bit about the history of Corinth and what Corinth was like as a city at that particular time, would not be surprised by these particular happenings. But we need to look deeper than that. Uh, we need, need to look a little bit at the origin of such behavior. Where does it come from? And Paul is quite clear about that in verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. Uh, the the AV puts it as so that we would not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. And I suppose nowadays we don't hear many sermons about Satan. In fact, I remember being told once after I'd preached, not on this passage, but on another passage concerning Satan, I was told by uh, an elder in the congregation, I'm not going to say which congregation or where it was, who said to me, you shouldn't preach on Satan. I said, why not? He says, you'll frighten people and they'll stop coming to church. Well, the whole idea of dealing with Satan is indeed to frighten people. That's the whole purpose. If Satan is not a figure of fear, a figure of fright, then unfortunately we have completely misunderstood who and what he is. And I want to look in much more detail at this particular character called Satan. Who is he? And then to consider his devices. And then thirdly, what do we do to protect ourselves from Satan? So a fascinating uh, <coughs> poll taken uh, not so long ago, it was in the United States actually, which suggested that over 80% of people in the United States, whatever their religion, if they have one or not, no longer believe in the existence of Satan. I'm sure that the figure in our own country would be quite similar. Whenever you see a portrayal of Satan nowadays, it's generally speaking as a figure of fun. He is the horned character who appears quite often round about Halloween, etc., and has become quite a favourite with children in many places to dress up as, as a figure of fun. And therefore, <coughs> Satan is no longer taken seriously 
in our society. And perhaps we're all a little bit guilty of that, that we don't take Satan seriously. Who is he historically? What, where does he come from? Well, the first mention that we have of him is in the book of Job. And you remember that the book of Job is probably the earliest written scripture contemporary with Abraham and certainly well before <laughs> Moses wrote the books of the law. And the first chapter of Job, first, second chapter of Job, revealed to us much about Satan and his relationship with God. We're told that his name means the adversary. He is the adversary of God's people. And that's exactly what we see him doing when he comes, of course, seeking permission to attack Job in his situation. But you notice, if you look carefully at the first couple of chapters of Job, Satan is not allowed to speak until God speaks to him. Perhaps it's a wonder to us and a surprise to us that Satan appears among the angels in heaven, that he has access to the throne room of God. That is a mystery that we don't really understand, but we'll come to that in a moment or two. And you remember that it is God who first speaks to Satan and says, what are you up to, etc., more or less, and Satan tells him he's been walking up and down the earth, etc., and so on. And then it is God who says to him, have you considered my servant Job? Now, if you're not familiar with that passage, go back and read the first chapter of Job, the first and second chapter of Job. And you will see how God restricts what Satan can do. He is allowed, first of all, to attack Job's possessions. And then he is allowed to attack Job himself. You remember Satan's argument to God. He says, does Job fear, fear God for nothing? And therefore he is given leave to attack Job in his health. But through all that, you and I are privileged to be given access to chapters 1 and 2 of Job. Job never knew why he suffered that the way that he did. Because no one has ever suffered like Job, with the exception, perhaps, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's a different kind of suffering altogether. And so as we see this figure appearing for the first time, in the Old Testament, uh, some people will say, well, that's not the first time he appears. He appears in the Garden of Eden. But he appears in a different form, and he's not, he is not called Satan in the book of Genesis. He is referred to as the serpent. <coughs> Excuse me. And you will remember how Satan is so clever at dealing, first of all, with Eve. It's a wonder, isn't it, in a sense, uh, that a snake, if, if the serpent is a snake, that's what we assume, could actually speak to Eve. But Eve doesn't see anything unusual about that. And many theologians have surmised that at that particular time, before the fall in the Garden of Eden, that there was conversation between all the animals and Adam and Eve in the state of perfection that existed in the garden. However, that's highly debatable, and I'm not going to go any further into that. But he is so clever in deceiving Eve. Has God really forbidden you to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And remember that the Bible doesn't say it's an apple. We, we have so been conditioned into the belief that the forbidden fruit was an apple. 
Where did that come from? It came like so many other things, like the halos round the disciples and so on. It comes from the paintings that were made of the scenes. The Bible simply speaks of the forbidden fruit. And you remember how Satan deceives Eve into thinking, nah, see, it's not really like that. If you eat the fruit, you'll be like God's. Nothing will happen to you. And so Eve was tempted. And you remember that Eve sins by deception. But Adam sins willingly. He could have refused. To partake of the fruit that his wife offers to him. But he does so willingly. And it is from there of course that the concept of original sin comes to us. That we are all born with the fallen nature of Adam. And even if you are holy in every other thing that you do. In every day of your life. You are still Guilty of original sin. Pechagin, as they say in Gaelic. Original sin. You can't get away from that. It's in your nature. And it's there and will be there until the day that you are fully sanctified in eternity. But we have to ask and question as well, where did Satan come from? Who is he or what is he? How did he just appear in the Garden of Eden? And remember that Adam and Eve, uh, most, people, most people think that Adam and Eve sinned uh, almost immediately as soon as they were in the Garden. That's very probably not the case. They may well have been in the Garden for hundreds of years before the fall actually took place. We don't know. We just don't know. It's speculation. But where was Satan before that? <clears throat> and what was he? Now we're told in scripture <clears throat> that he was an angel. And we're told various things about him. The Lord Jesus Christ himself says in Luke 10 and verse 18 that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning when he was <coughs> cast out of heaven. And most theologians think that uh, <clears throat> from the description that were given in Revelation in chapter 12 and verse 4 that his tail, the tail of the dragon as he's referred to in Revelation, drew a third of the stars with him. And they conclude from that that a third of the angels rebelled in heaven against Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and were cast out of heaven as a result. Now, again, <coughs> that may or may not be the case. How did Satan fall? Well, there are two passages that are used from the Old Testament to uh, perhaps bring this into perspective. One is from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 14, and the other one is from the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 28. And both of these passages, although one refers to the prince of Babylon and the other to the prince of Tyre, nevertheless the descriptions that are given would seem to suggest that this is Satan that is being spoken. If you look at Ezekiel 28, I'll just mention a few verses from it there. Ezekiel 28 and verse 15, 14 onwards. This is what Ezekiel writes. You were an, an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. 
you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and so on. Now from that passage and the parallel passage in Isaiah, <coughs> it is concluded that Satan sinned through pride. That that was his sin. And it's frightening if you and I consider what, what effect pride has on our own lives, on our own behaviour. The Council of Nicaea in 625, when the Catholic Church, and I mean the Universal Church then, not the Roman Catholic Church, that term doesn't come in until the Reformation of the 16th century, when they tried to catalogue sin and put them in an order of the most serious. They discovered and they worked out, the theologians there worked out, the church fathers, that every single <coughs> sin that we commit emanates from pride. That pride is the most serious problem that we have as human beings. And of course, if you come from there, <coughs> you can easily see how pride spreads out into all kinds of other activities. It is concluded from that passage in Ezekiel and the passage in Isaiah, <coughs> for those who agree with those, this interpretation, and there are many who don't. There are many theologians who think it doesn't refer to Satan at all, but refers simply to the prince of Babylon and the prince of Tyre. I've still to make up my mind on that. I find that sometimes I think that's the case, other times I think it does refer to Satan. Uh, there are very interesting passages to, uh, to compare. But the conclusion from that is <coughs> that Satan was an archangel one of the two archangels in heaven. The only other one that is mentioned in scripture in the letter of Jude is Michael. Michael the archangel. And it is concluded <coughs> that Satan rebelled against God from his position as archangel because of pride. <coughs> I don't know if we'll ever get a clear answer to that. In a sense, it doesn't matter. For what matters is that he rebelled and was cast out of heaven. And Jesus himself is the witness to that. And Jesus also describes him in John 8, 44, as the father of lies. The father of lies. And later on, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 11, Paul describes him as an angel of light in disguise. That he is able to disguise himself as a good guy, as an angel of light. I came across a belief in Peru when we were there <coughs> for a long period of time uh, that I had never heard anywhere else. And I've never heard it anywhere else since then. And it was taught in much of uh, many of the evangelical churches in Peru that Satan had been the master of music in heaven and in charge of worship and praise. And when I asked various pastors and so on, well, where do you get that idea from? They took it from the passage in Ezekiel in the authorized version where it talks about its tablets and pipes, i.e. with the idea of music. Personally, I don't, I don't think that is correct, but uh, I simply mention it again as a piece of information that you might come across somewhere, uh, quite interesting. So this is what Satan is. He is nothing other than a fallen angel. Now it's easy to say that, <coughs> but we have to be very careful as well that the angels have powers that you and I do not understand. There are things we are permitted to know that the angels desire to look into. We're told that in scripture. Especially when it comes to regeneration. 
Uh, and those are things <coughs> that the fallen angels, of course, attempt at all times to prevent. <laughs> and we tend to trivialize them by talking about Satan's little helpers. They are not little. If a third of the angels fell along with Satan, then there are several million of them. That's an immense number. And they're here, there, and everywhere, causing as much damage to God's word and God's people as they can. If you have time, <coughs> uh, not now, of course, but later on, I would thoroughly recommend to you a little book by C.S. Lewis. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's called The Screwtape Letters. Uh, and basically, it's an old devil or an old demon, an old fallen angel, giving advice to a young demon as to how to entrap Christians and how to get them into trouble to, so that they lose their faith. <laughs> Now, it's a fascinating concept, of course, but again, uh, there's a flaw in it in the sense that all angels were created at the same time. There cannot be such a thing, as we understand Scripture, as a young angel and an old angel. They're all from the same time period. When angels were created is, again, uh, a, a, a big argument, but again, that's a digression. We don't know. Exactly, scripture doesn't tell us when they were created. But we know then that Satan is the leader. That's who he is. And then we have to come to consider what his devices actually are. Well, the Lord gives us this clue that he is the father of lies. And then he says also that he is a murderer from the beginning. And you will remember when uh, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan that he is able to quote scripture to the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows the scriptures probably much better than you and I do. And that should make us ashamed. Because he can use them against us. And he can use them to make us doubt what scripture actually says. <coughs> and therefore you and I need to be familiar with the scripture. We're told many other things. We're told that he is permitted, as we saw with Job, to afflict God's people. He is not permitted to kill you but he is permitted to afflict you. And sometimes the persecution does lead to death. He claims that he has authority over the whole world. <clears throat> That's what he said when he tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. If you worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. And the Lord Jesus refers to him as the Prince of Darkness. And we see Paul referring to him again as the Prince of the Power of the Air in Ephesians 5, 5 and 6. What else does he do? He blinds unbelievers. He continues to make them think that A, he doesn't exist, and all that matters in this world is having a good time, enjoying it as much as possible. Now, there is nothing wrong with enjoying many of the good things that God has given us. But when these things take the place of the rightful worship of God, they are turned into idols. 
We saw this morning how idol worship was what led to the downfall of Israel and Judah and the exile to Babylon. And if you start to consider how many idols we have in our lives now, you might be surprised by the result. Oh, people will say, but we don't worship things of stone and uh, images and so on like that in the way that they did in those days. I know Satan is much more subtle than that. Consider the number of people who are worshipping in God's house. Not just here, but perhaps throughout our country in the course of the day. And consider that and compare it with the number of people who watch sporting events or who visit as spectators sporting events that take place on the Sabbath. The comparison is quite amazing. It used to be in our country that major sporting events didn't take place on the Sabbath. Especially football matches and things even Wimbledon finals, that the principles of the word of God were held in reverence. Not anymore. Why? <coughs> and the reason behind it, of course, is money. What matters so much in sporting events are the television rights and the amount of money involved in televising these things. Nothing wrong with sport in itself, quite the opposite. But when it becomes something that becomes an idol to us, then we have to think seriously about it. And so many people in our country are blinded by the idol of sport. So many other examples that we can give. When I was young, we used to talk about our pop idols. Cliff Richard and the Beatles. That's taking you back a bit, isn't it? Cliff Richard and the Beatles and so on. The idols. And you had a poster up on your wall in your bedroom, etc. Of your favourite pop idol. And notice how the word was so commonly used. And for some people they were idols. And that is still the case. How our modern day culture has turned much of our entertainment into <laughs> idols. Isn't it ridiculous when you think of it, when you think of it logically, that people who are able to act in front of a camera or on a screen, I have nothing against them, don't get me wrong, are able to earn far more money, perhaps with the exception of famous sports stars, but their careers are short by comparison, than in virtually any other occupation. Our priorities have gone sort of upside down. And nowadays with mass media and phones and all the rest of it, the effect of it is even greater. What about tolerance? This is one of Satan's greatest victories. First of all, to make people think that he doesn't exist. He's just a fun figure. But the way he has managed to get us to tolerate all sorts of things in our society is perhaps his biggest victory of all. Nowadays, everything is to be tolerated with the exception of Christianity in our country. Isn't it sad that if you look, the tables have reversed? I'm not suggesting that we go back a hundred years to Victorian to set stereotypes or anything like that. But I find it quite amazing that a tiny minority of people have taken Satan's sin of pride and turned pride into a new religion. A tiny minority. When we come to speak about the whole gay movement and everything connected with it, 
What percentage of the population are they? Very small minority. And yet the influence they have on politics, on the media, on the press, and everything else, is way beyond their number. There's a new book out by, I can't forget, the, I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, uh, that's questions as to whether pride, and the, uh, meaning the, the phenomenon of pride, has become the new religion of our country. This is what Satan does. He convinces us to think that the principles of God's word no longer matter. Truth. Even Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? And you and I are now made to question as to what truth actually is. We hear so many rumors Donald Trump famously put it as fake news, even although he was spreading most of it himself. And so you get into, as when you get into politics and things, fake news, the truth being twisted, corruption is widespread everywhere. We might be surprised to know the level of corruption that goes on in our country. And I agree, it's nothing like what goes on in other countries. In Peru, for example, you couldn't do anything without paying a bribe. Even when the policeman stopped you in a traffic stop, all he wanted was that you would give him a banknote in your driving license as you handed it over. And we were stopped on more, more than one occasion like that. And I knew the procedure, but I refused point blank to do it, as did others. But the majority of people, for a quiet life, they would simply pass over with a tin, uh, tin sol note inside it, and that was the end of it, about a couple of pounds. The time I spent in Argentina, it was exactly the same. You couldn't do anything in Argentina without bribing. If you wanted your shipping containers and stuff to come out of the ports, you had to bribe the officials. And it's widespread over Latin America. It's widespread over the, over the Caribbean and Mexico as well. It's widespread throughout Africa. How much of the money that is channeled in Africa into what are supposed to be good causes and helpful NGOs for the government, etc., are siphoned off to individuals, corrupt individuals. I don't need to go on about that. You know very well that that takes place in so many places. You see, the love of money and the love of power these are the two key things that Satan uses all the time to bring corruption into society. But remember this. Satan is not all-powerful. And he is not omniscient. He does not have the attributes of God. And we tend to forget that God is sovereign and Satan is permitted only to act within the parameters that God allows him to do so. And some of us might question, well, why does God allow Satan to act at all? That's a very interesting question, of course, but uh, the simple answer to it is that if God didn't allow Satan to act, there would have been no need for the Lord Jesus Christ and no need for the cross. Wasn't that what was predicted in the Genesis? That the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. It's a very interesting thing that whenever you think of the virgin birth, the seed of the woman, I think I've mentioned it before. We know biologically that the seed comes from the man, not from the woman. The woman provides the egg. But scripture says the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. 
And that is, of course, what we see happening in the book of Revelation. So many other things that he's up to. Euthanasia, the right to die. What about the lottery? Gambling. Gambling has become a normal part of society. I'm shocked every time I go into Tesco's or uh, even in uh, Spa or any of the big, big shops and so on by the number of people that I see buying lottery tickets all the time. There's always a queue to buy lottery tickets. We have become a nation of gamblers. It even invades <coughs> our homes where the results of the lotteries are often given on television. And quite apart from that, we are encouraged to buy these tickets for good causes. But yet, it is gambling. And it's expressly forbidden in the law of God to gamble. And yet, that is what our capitalist Western society is built on. The whole process of the markets and stocks and shares and everything else is a form of gambling. Now, it's easy to say that. It's very difficult to say, how would our society exist without it? And that is an argument and a question that we could debate for hours, and I'm not going to go into that one. There's so many other things. All you have to do is look at the whole process of sexual matters. How sex is used as a commodity nowadays. That the idea of abstaining from sex before marriage is regarded as outdated and ridiculous by the majority of people. And yet if you think of the amount of money that is involved in the trafficking of sex, especially with girls from various countries, into our own country, from Eastern Europe. Never mind drugs and alcohol and the various other things. And there are so many things that we could look at. But the time has gone by. And so we need to consider finally, how do we protect ourselves? If we are not ignorant of Satan's designs, how do we protect ourselves from him? Well, there was a, a verse, not a verse, a few verses this morning as we were looking at the balm of Gilead that I remembered afterward an old Afri Afri Afro-American hymn or, or spiritual as they used to be called that said, There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. And you may be familiar with the further verses of that. If not, you can find it online. And that was what we were considering. That's the balm that is contained in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you remember our Lord said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you savour not the things of God, but the things of men. And scripture, especially in the New Testament, gives us various remedies against Satan. We are told to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6. And I'm sure you've heard many sermons on the whole armor of God. Peter says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist him. Stand up against him. Get thee behind me, Satan. You use the words of the Lord Jesus and he will flee from you. The hymn writer put it like this. He said, Yield not to temptation. For yielding is sin. Not the temptation. Our Lord was tempted in that way. 
Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. And it's when you and I yield to the temptation that is put before us, and the temptation will be put before you. Every single believer will be tempted every single day to sin in one way or another. And it is how you resist that temptation that really matters. Put on the whole armour of God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. And that is why you need the balm that is from Gilead that we were speaking about this morning that you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you need the blood of the cross, and you need to see the atonement that was made for sin, because sin was introduced when Satan fell from heaven. It's fascinating to think that the first place that sin <gasps> appeared in was not the garden, but in heaven itself when Satan and his minions rebelled against God. There was complete free will among the angels. The free will to obey or the free will to rebel. You and I have free will in everything except in our salvation. That has been foreordained by God since before the foundation of the world. But you can rest assured that if you come to him seeking the balm of Gilead, seeking to find peace in the atonement that was made on the cross of Calvary, that you will find it. That's what you see in the final chapters of Scripture in the book of Revelation, where Jesus promises that when he's speaking to the seven churches, that those who seek me will find. And then when you see what happens afterwards with the four horsemen of the apocalypse coming forward, the white horse, the Lord Jesus and Christ himself spreading his word through the world. And there are hardly any places left that the word hasn't reached, but there are still some. I think I mentioned last week the Sentinel Islands in the Indian Ocean where no one is allowed to land. Anyone who tries to land there is killed. They have never heard the word of God. And there are other places as well. And yet Satan is still active even there. But the word of God is being put forth by the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the rider on the white horse. And you remember what follows. That what follows immediately is the black horse. Sorry, the red horse is the second one. War, warfare. Wherever the word of God goes, persecution follows. Persecution follows after it. And after the persecution, follows the rider on the black horse, holding the scales. And as you see, and as you look at the description of the scales, you see that what's contained there is prices, inflation, the cost of everything rising. In other words, poverty. After war, very often comes poverty. And of course, the rider on the pale horse, the final one, is death itself. Death that is brought in through the fall in the Garden of Eden. What a mess Satan has made of the world. What a mess he has made, if you're honest about your own life, of your life and my life as well. But nevertheless, isn't it in God's mercy and God's grace that a remedy has been provided? God could have left us without any kind of salvation. But in his good pleasure, he has chosen 
to send the Lord Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sin on the cross of Calvary and so that through the blood that was shed an atonement is made. Remember if you break that word down at one meant with God to be at peace with God that's what atonement means and that's so often isn't that what so many people are looking for nowadays they want peace 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 as we read this morning and yet there is no peace said the prophet as Jeremiah considered the evils that had fallen over his land and you and I would do well to consider the evils that have fallen over our own land and to see how Satan has gained an advantage. But more than anything else, we need to remember the remedy. The remedy is there. The Lord Jesus Christ is still calling sinners to himself. And in this sin-sick world, there is a remedy. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick home. And there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you are sovereign. You are the God who is over all things. And you are the one who permits Satan to act up to a certain point and no further. And you tell us in scripture that you will always provide a way from us to escape from the temptation. The problem is so often that the sin that we think of is so pleasurable. And yet that is what lures us into thinking that it has no serious consequence. But your word tells us that the wages of sin is death. Help us to meditate on these things, to take Satan and his minions seriously. And we thank you that we are able to consider these things this evening. Bless it to us and pardon our sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us conclude then by singing in Psalm 106. On page 382. Psalm 106, <coughs> verse 43. We'll sing these verses down to the end of the psalm. He that is God many times delivered them, but with their counsel so they him provoked, that for their sin they were brought very low. Yet their affliction he beheld when he did hear their cry, and he for them is covenant did call to memory. I didn't have time to go into God's covenant mercies this evening. After his mercies multitude he did repent and made them to be pitied of all those who did them captive lead. O Lord our God, us save and gather the heathen from among that we thy holy name may praise in a triumphant song. Blessed be Jehovah Israel's God through all eternity. Let all the people say Amen. Praise to the Lord give ye. Let us sing these verses in conclusion then. He many times delivered them. He many times delivered them, but with their counsel so
of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. <laughs>